It's so good to see everybody in the room. It's so good to see new people, some people I've never seen before. I love it. And to see some familiar faces. Hey, if you guys don't know who I am, my name is John, and I serve as one of the pastors here at Calvary. And I'm so pumped that you guys would join us on a Friday. Seriously, if it's your first time here, thank you so much for coming on a Friday night where you, we know you could be anywhere on the entire planet, but you're here where we believe is the best place that you could be. We got some incredible people here. We got some incredible friends that you can meet here. And so after, you're going to go ahead and go into something called a connect group where you will literally be put in a place with just people that are going to love you and care on you. It's going to be awesome. But how many of you guys are loving this series that we're going through so far called Scary Hours? It's been awesome. Last week we talked about can you smoke weed as a Christian? Crazy, crazy. Today we're going to go through another um, topic that I know you got questions on. And so you're going to have a chance to ask more questions about it. But uh, somebody say two weeks from now for me. So in two weeks from now, we got our encounter night happening. And you're not going to want to miss it. Trust me, the giveaways are going to be worth it. X, can I tell him what it is? Where's X? Oh, he's outside. Okay, he, he, he just made a graphic for it. I won't tell you guys. But if you guys follow us on underscore Calvary Youth on Instagram, you'll find out what it is this week. And it's going to be amazing. There's some crazy giveaways. It's going to be awesome. But anybody have their Bible on them? Anybody have their Bible on them? Anybody got a physical copy? Anybody got glow-in-the-dark Bibles? Oh, we got some physical copies. All right, cool. We guys turn me to Proverbs chapter one. I'm just gonna read one verse. I'm reading one verse today, and we're gonna get into it. And again, I know you're gonna have questions on this topic, but Proverbs chapter one says this: "The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction." The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. If you have a pen, if you can highlight in your app or anything like that, I want you to highlight that verse, especially that part, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. We're going through this series called Scary Hours, and we're answering questions that we know that you have because we got to grow a little bit more wisdom in our life. We got to have a little bit more answers on things that we're scared to ask, on things that we're afraid to ask because we think, what are people going to think about me? Are people going to judge me if I ask these questions? But no, we want you to answer these questions. Because fools despise wisdom and knowledge. Let's go ahead and let's be people that ask questions. Let's ask questions. And if you got them, ask them. Ask your leaders. I promise you, your leaders will not think of you differently. Your leaders will not judge you, but they want to be here with you on the season. On this topic, I want to preach a message that I just titled, Does the Bible Talk About Dating and Sex? That's right. I said, I said that word in church. I said that word in church. We're talking about it. We know that you guys talk about it in school. We know that you guys talk about it everywhere. Let's talk about it in church. And I believe that God has something to say about it. And we're going to talk about it tonight. And we're going to talk about it in our connect group. So let's pray. I believe that God is going to do something in our lives tonight. So Lord, we thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you that you're here. We thank you that you're gracious. We thank you that you're enough, God. We thank you that there's no one like you. We thank you that you saved us, God. I pray for anybody in the room that's just struggling in any area of their life, God, especially in this area. God, I pray that you may set some people free today, Lord, that they can know that they don't have to go to people for validation. They don't have to go to people for love. They don't have to go to people to get approval, God. But you've already approved of them. You already validated them, God. You care so much about them, God. And I pray that you speak to every single person in the room today. Lord, we give you all praise, all honor, and all glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray and everybody says. Come on, everybody says. Come on, if you love Jesus, can you make some noise one time? Anybody a fan of sweets in the room? All right, on the count of three, I need you to shout your favorite dessert for me. Ready? One, two, three. Okay. All I heard, all I heard was chocolate cake and ice cream cake. Everybody like cho chocolate cake and ice cream cake? I personally love chocolate chip cookies. Anybody love chocolate chip cookies? Love me a good chocolate chip cookie. I love some brownies. Anybody love some brownies? Good. When they're warm and soft. Anybody love apple pie? I love apple pie. I love me some sweets. But especially chocolate chip cookies. But I don't know, anybody grew up like me just hearing, hey, you can't eat too much sweets. You can't eat too much sweets. I heard it my whole life. Hey, don't eat sweets before dinner. Don't eat cookies before dinner. Hey, once you eat your dinner, then you can eat some cookies. That, that's what I heard my whole life. X was talking about the cookies from lunch, and I just started to get some flashbacks about those cookies, and they were warm and soft. I love some good chocolate chip cookies. But if you're only told 
that you can't eat chocolate chip cookies, your question is going to be, why? Why? Why can't I eat chocolate chip cookies all the time if they taste so good? Like, if they taste good, they, they got to be good for you. And you'll ask, why? I just want to eat some chocolate chip cookies. It's not until somebody explains to you after, and they tell you, no, all these sweets, all these desserts, they got so much sugar that if you're not careful, you can get some diabetes. If you're not careful, if you eat too much of them, you'll get a little bit overweight. Your you'll overconsumption is a good, and you got to balance. But the question is always asked wrong. The question is always portrayed wrong. The question is always intentionally asked wrong. And I think as we talk about what the Bible talks about dating and sex, I believe for too long, the church, it's something that if you grew up in church, you, all you've heard is don't have sex. Don't have sex before marriage. That's all you've heard going to church and you think, okay, cool. Why? Why? Everybody else is doing it. All my friends are doing it. Everybody around me, oh, that's what I'm seeing on TV. That's what I'm seeing on TV shows. Everyone is talking about the girls and the guys that they're hooking up with, but yet you're stuck in the middle of what you're hearing at church versus what all your friends are doing, and you're thinking, where do I go? What do I want to do? What do I do? What decision do I make? And I want to apologize if we haven't talked about this directly. I'm sorry that you've had to learn this from friends at school. I'm sorry that you've had to learn this from pornography. I'm sorry that you've had to learn this from TV shows. I'm sorry that you've had to learn this from movies. I'm sorry that you've had to learn this from your older cousin that was all to, always talking about the girls that they were getting with, the guys that they were hooking up with. I'm sorry that you've had to learn about it in all these different areas. And at church, we've been quiet about it. We've been quiet about it. I want to, talk, I want to apologize that we have not talked about it directly. And in this series, we want to talk about the questions that you have. We want to answer those questions that you have. We want to answer those questions that you're scared to ask because you think, what if I get judged? What, what if my leaders look at me different? I can't come into the same room if I'm asking these questions because they're, they're going to think of me that I'm just, I'm just this girl that's doing all these things and they're not going to look at me the same. They're not going to love me the same. I promise you there is nothing that you would do that would make any of us love you, but more than anything... There is nothing that you could do that would make a God, that makes our God love you any less. He sees you not by your mistakes, but he sees you by his son that was sent to die on a cross for you. And he says, I love you and I care about you. And you could seem like you're far away, but you are so close to me. I'm sorry that you've had to learn from all the wrong places. And we just want to talk about it. We want to let you know that God, he has a plan for this. He has a mission for this, and we want you to represent Jesus well. And we want you to grow up to be amazing and incredible women of God and men of God. We want you to grow to be people that are going to raise incredible families. We don't want you to just be good Calvary youth students, but we want you to grow up to be leaders, not just leaders in the church, but leaders in your families, leaders in your schools, leaders in your team. But it starts with the little things. It starts with the little questions. We just want to help you navigate through things. We want to help you navigate through these questions because here's the thing. Your friends at school can't be the standard for what God wants for you in dating and sex. Euphoria can't be the standard for sex and dating. Love is blind can't be your standard on relationships. Every show and movie that you are watching cannot be your standard. Culture's view on sex can't be your standard because it is hurting us so much more than we think. Our views on sex, the lies, it's tearing up the way that we view each other. It's tearing up the, our families. So many more people, so many more marriages are crumbling together because they are constantly cheating on each other and there's so much infidelity happening and it all starts from this small root. It all starts from our questions on these things and not being taught correctly. And that's why we have apps like Tinder that we could constantly just normalize in our life. And maybe when you get older, it's like, I'll just go ahead and join Tinder because it's the easy thing to do. The way that we view sex and dating has been distorted. It's been distorted. And our standard has become what culture is telling us about it. Sleep with as many people as you want. Watch as much porn as you want. Fulfill every fantasy that you have. And what we don't know is it's actually destroying us. It's actually killing us from the inside out. And we need an answer. We, we need a new standard, not just a standard that everybody else has, but we need a new standard. Well, where's my standard supposed to come from? 
because I've been told one thing and I've been told another thing, but where's my standard supposed to come from? I want to read Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8 for a second. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8 says, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of God endures forever. In other words, I'm going to rephrase that. People change. People will hurt you. Culture will wither. People will get older. Things that people are saying right now will change and fall, but the word of God endures forever. The word of God remains the same. The word of God is never irrelevant. The word of God never goes out of style. The word of God never changes. It is constant, it is consistent, and it is the thing we have to value our life on. It has to be the thing that we value our marriages on. It has to be the thing that we value our relationships on. It has to change everything to our friendships, to the way that we view our parents, to the way that we see our friends at school. The word of God is what we need. The word of God is going to dictate our lives. It's not just another book that you read, but the word of God is alive. It's alive and it wants to speak to every single one of us today. So we just want to talk a little bit about what the word of God says in these objects what the word of God says in these subjects. Because when we do things according to his time frame, when we do things according to what God wants, according to how he's designed things, there's gonna be so much more blessing in the long run. Not just some temporary pleasure that we want right now, but what's happening in the long run. Well, let's talk about a few things. First thing I wanna talk about is dating. Let's talk about dating. You ever had a question on dating? Anybody? Ever had some questions on dating? Let's talk about dating. So actually, the word dating and the concept of dating is not found in the Bible. Wait, wait, wait. You just went on this whole spiel about how the word of God is what we need to follow and how the word of God is what we need to look to and how the word of God is never changing, but it doesn't talk about dating. And yet we're talking about dating. Like, you make no sense. Why are you talking about this then? It doesn't talk about dating. It doesn't talk about courting the way that we might look at it today but it does mention a few things. The Bible talks about it indirectly. In a sense, it talks about the company we should keep. That's a big part of dating. As the Bible says that bad company corrupts good character. It talks about the boundaries that we should set. There was a man named Samson that he had one job. All he couldn't do was cut his hair. That's all he couldn't do, cut his hair. But he didn't set boundaries in his life. And because he didn't set boundaries in his life, eventually he pushed his boundaries just a little bit further and just a little bit further, just a little bit further. The one thing he couldn't do, his hair got chopped, his hair got cut, and he lost all his power. The Bible talks about the boundaries we should set. Oh, that, that's, that's in dating. Dating, is, it, you're gonna, you got to know about some boundaries. you got to know about the company we should set. Oh, it doesn't talk about dating, but the Bible talks about the character of people that will be our life partners with us. So it doesn't talk about it directly, but it sure does talk about it indirectly. So dating, I don't believe it's wrong if God's at the center of it, if God's in the middle of it. See, whatever we do, it has to surround God. We can't do something and say, God, I want you to surround it. No, no, no. We say, God... I want to do this, and it has to surround you. It has to be according to what you want. It has to be according to what your will is. It has to be, oh, you're talking about good care, about how bad character corrupts good company. I, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm surrounding myself around good company. I, I want to make sure that I'm surrounding myself around the right people. I want to make sure, God, I want to surround my dating. I want to surround my life. I want to surround everything around you, not the other way around. It can't be the other way around. I can't say, God, I know you talk about this, but I'm just going to do what I want, and then you bless it later. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. God, he gives us parameters. He gives us things that we got to do, and then we say, God, I want to surround it around you. And I want to ask you, if you're saying, hey, I want to date, or maybe you're dating, I want to ask you, why are you dating? Why are you dating? Is it because you feel alone? I don't want to feel alone. I don't want to feel by myself. I'm, I'm tired of feeling by myself all the time. I'm tired of feeling alone all the time. So, so I'm just going to go ahead and start to date someone. Are you dating because you just want to be good at it in the future? Or are you, do you want to date because of the fact that you want to get validation because you're not getting validation at home? Do you want to date because maybe you'll feel loved? Oh, maybe I'll feel loved if I actually start to date somebody because that person is going to give me the approval and the love that I need. Why do you want to date? And if you give me a valid reason, I'll be like, let's go. 
Let's walk through it. Let's talk about it. Because I'm, I'm for it if it's, in, if it's surrounded around God, if you're around some good company, if you're going ahead and your values are the same, your morals are the same, let's say, hey, let's do it. Let's talk about it. And I really believe this because I really believe that there's value in godly counsel. There's value when you can talk to your leaders and you don't hide it. You say, ah, if you have to hide the person that you're talking to, you probably shouldn't be talking to that person. But if you can go to your leader and say, hey, I want to introduce you to this person. I, I want you to meet this person. And ask your leader to genuinely believe, tell you what they believe about that person. Because godly counsel is important. I want you to see what Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14 says. Where there is no guidance, a people fall. Oh, you want to fall? Have no guidance. Have no guidance in your life. Have no people that help you in your life. Have no people that believe in you in your life. But in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. Oh, we got to surround ourselves around some good people. We got to surround ourselves and ask the very people in our life that not are going to tell you what you want to hear, but the ones that tell you what you need to hear. When you got some people that tell you what you need to hear, and they tell you the things that might sting sometimes, and they tell you the thing, I'm not talking about from a judgmental perspective, because we can judge people easily. Oh, in the church, we love to judge people sometimes. We love to judge people sometimes. No, when you get some people that say, hey, I'll believe the best in you. I believe that God's hand is over your life. I believe that he's called you. I believe that he's chosen you. And because of that, I want to give you the best advice, and I want to tell you what I think about this person. I've had to tell some students, that, hey, that person, you know you shouldn't be with them. You know you shouldn't. Not because I'm judging that person, but because I love that student so much. But I've had some other ones, and I'm like, man, I'm so happy you guys are together. I'm so pumped. Where's Adrian at? Where's Adrian Muncia? He's in the back. When Adrian told me he was dating Joy, he was, a, he was a junior in high school. And I told him, I told him, I'm so happy because I love them both. And they both love Jesus. And they surround themselves around God. It's like, man, I, I love that. But then there's been some other ones that I'm like, that's not it. But we got to, the count, who, we, who we go and who we go to for counsel is important. If you were to date, make sure you got some boundaries set. Make sure you know what you're going to do. Make sure you know what you're not going to do. Know what your standard is. You, you have to make sure that you have people that keep you accountable in your life. And if you're not, hey, it's time to come to youth. Get some people that will keep you accountable. And I promise you it will change your life because you don't want to find yourself in a place that you don't want to be. Okay, so if I'm dating, this is a question that everybody has. You ready for this one? How do I know if they're the one? How do I know if they're the one? Raise your hand if you've ever asked this question, thought this question. How do I know if they're the one? You guys are a bunch of liars. Five of you guys. Everybody's asked this question. I think my wife's here. I heard her. Oh, I love my wife. My wife's amazing. She's in the room. By the way, next, next Saturday, we are two years married. It's crazy. I'm so pumped. I'm sure if you asked my wife 10 years ago what her future husband would look like, she would have said either a Jonas brother, Justin Bieber, or a six foot tall, dark, tall, dark and handsome man. Like that's, that's what she would have got. But she got a five foot six white boy who is not tall, dark and handsome and not a Jonas brother. If you would have asked me 10 years ago, I would have probably said I, was, I would have had somebody a lot shorter than me. See, my wife and I were about the same height. I say I'm taller, but she thinks otherwise. But, but if you would have asked me 10 years ago, I would have been like, oh, she would, she would be five feet or five one, so that way she could wear heels and I don't feel mad little, right? Um, we always tend to make these lists. We always tend to make these standards. We always tend to make these things that they have to meet every single checkbox. They have to go ahead and they have to be six feet tall. They, they have to do this. They have to love sports. They have to all these things. And we fit in all these boxes. And here's the thing. There's no such thing as the one. There's no such thing as the one. Very few times will everybody ever meet every single box that you want to check. We spend so much time wondering, asking, thinking, is that person the one? Are they the one? Do they cross everything I have on my list? And I think, honestly, we're asking the wrong questions. We're asking the wrong question. Honestly, I think the question that we should be asking is not, are they the one? But they should be asking, am I the one? You should be asking yourself, am I the one? Am I the one that's going to be pointing somebody closer to Jesus? Am I the person that has healed and I'm not going to bleed on somebody that I'm talking to? 
Am I the one that actually has a plan for my future? Some of you seniors, where are my seniors at? You don't gotta raise your hand because I'm about to roast you guys. Seniors, some of you guys are in this room and you have no plans for your future, but yet you still wanna date somebody. Where are you gonna take that person? McDonald's for the rest of your life? Like, you gotta ask yourself, am I the one? Am I the one that my future wife is gonna want? A am I the one that my future husband's gonna want? A am I the one that is gonna actually have some values? Am I the one that's actually gonna encourage my spouse? A am I the one that's actually gonna lift people up? Am I the one? We're asking the wrong question time and time again. We gotta think future. We gotta think forward. They become the one when you realize, I promise to love them the way that Jesus loves his church. Love is a choice. Love is something that you choose. It's not something that just comes. It's not something that just happens from one day to the next. Love is something that you choose. Yes, you have to find them attractive. Yes, you have to like their personality. Yes, you have to enjoy being around each other. But you have to ask yourself, does this person point me to Jesus or away from Jesus? I remember when I, when I met Andrea, I didn't know she was the one right away. Eventually she became my one. But it's because I realized that she was kind. I loved being around her. I believe she's the most beautiful girl on the entire planet. I really do. But most importantly, she believed that Jesus was at the center of her life. And that was it. She valued her purity. She wasn't trying to pressure me to do things that I didn't want to do. She had goals. She knew that she wanted to be a teacher. She knew exactly where she wanted to go to school. She knew exactly where she wanted to teach. She had some goals in her life. Some of us, we don't got goals in our life, and yet we still want somebody. Are you the one? We've been asking the wrong question. Ah, I, I want this girl. I, I really think this one's the one. But yet you don't even know what they're like. You don't even know their values. You don't even know anything. When Jesus is the priority in their life, it can change everything. Make sure you got some goals. Make sure they got some goals. Make sure your values align. Make sure that Jesus is at the center. Okay, how do I handle it? when I'm pressured to do things physically with my boyfriend or girlfriend that I don't wanna do? That's the next question. How do I handle it when I'm pressured to do things with my boyfriend or girlfriend that I physically don't want to do? When I started dating Andrea, uh, when I realized that this is someone that I could see myself, we, we asked each other and the question came up, like, hey, what is your view on this standpoint? We both, had to, we both agreed, like, hey, we wanna save ourselves onto marriage. When you have this conversation with somebody, if one of the party is not on the same page, that's a red flag because it is so easy to fall. We were on the same page and yet it's still easy to fall. I'm, I'm so happy to say that we saved ourselves from marriage and it was a beautiful thing, but, but there were some times where it wasn't easy. It was the hardest thing in the world. It was like, man, is this gonna get any easier across dating? It doesn't. Well, you guys have to stick with it. We have to be like, hey, we have to be on the same page for this. We have to be clear off for this. We want to save ourselves for all that God wants to do in our life. And if you're dating somebody, eventually you're gonna have to pick either what this person wants or what God wants. You're gonna have to make a choice. You're gonna have to make a choice every single time. And realistically, our flesh nine out of 10 times is gonna choose what a person wants rather than what God wants. And so from the beginning, you shouldn't even be having it. It's like, hey, I, I said it from a young age. Like, I don't, I don't want to have somebody in my life that's going to be doing this. I, I don't want to, I want to have somebody in my life that is going to value this just as much as I do. You have to be intentional about it. You have to be intentional about it. We had to set some boundaries in our life. We had to set some boundaries early. Hey, we're not going to be in a car alone by ourselves in a remote place. We're not going to be in one of each other's homes when our parents are not home. Because again, it could happen in a second. You got to set boundaries in your life in your life because it's, you gotta make a plan. You gotta have a plan. And if there's somebody that can't respect your boundaries, then they don't respect you. They don't respect you. To that person, you can say, peace. Like, I, I don't want to have anything to do that because you gotta think, I love Jesus way more than I love this person because Jesus loves me when I was at my worst. Jesus loves me when I was far away. Jesus loves me. Jesus gave me grace when I didn't even deserve it. Jesus gave me grace when I was doing things I shouldn't have done. Jesus goes, because of that, that's going to be my value. That's going to be my priority. That's going to be the thing that I lean on. Next question, can I date someone who's not a Christian?
Can I date someone who's not a Christian? And the first thing I would ask you is, what's the most important thing in your life? What's the most important thing in your life? Because if you can genuinely say, well, Jesus is the most important thing in my life, my relationship with God is the most important thing, then you can't afford to have anything take that spot. I need you to read what 2 Corinthians says. I love this verse, in this, in this translation especially. It says, don't become partners with those who reject God. How can you make a partnership out of right and wrong? That's not partnership, that's war. Is light best friends with dark? Oh, catch this. Does Christ go strolling with the devil? Do trust and mistrust hold hands? Who would think of setting up pagan idols in God's holy temple? But that is exactly what we are, each of us, a temple in whom God lives. Can we go back to that last verse? Don't become partners with those who reject God. It's plain and simple. Like, hey, can I date somebody who's not a Christian? No. Like, if you're a Christian and you genuinely believe, like, hey, I want to follow Jesus. Like, I want to do this right. I would say, it's clear. Don't become partners with those who reject God. Young people, they might be so nice. They might be so great. But there will be a day where you will have to pick between God and this person. And again, I just said it, but I promise you, nine out of ten times, we will choose that person every single time. On Friday nights, you know where you're going to want to be? Right here at youth. You know where they're going to want to be? Anywhere else. They're going to want to be at the movies. They're going to want to be at a party. They're going to want to be at a football game. They're going to want to be Netflix and chilling. But you're going to say, hey, I, I have a priority. I know where I want to be. And I believe when we honor God, he honors you. Don't settle because you don't want to be alone. Don't settle because you don't want to be by yourself. Don't settle because everyone else around you has a boyfriend or a girlfriend. You can find someone who loves Jesus, someone who serves alongside of you. My favorite thing in the entire world is that every single Sunday, my wife and I get to sit in service together. Every single week, my wife is praying for me daily. My wife is by my side. She is encouraging me. She is lifting me up. Oh, we need some people. I believe when we honor God, he honors us. When we say, God, I give you my life, he honors us every single time. Every single time. I'm going to keep moving fast because I'm almost out of time. Pretty much out of time. Okay. Why is sex wrong? Why is sex before marriage wrong, especially if two people are in love? All right. This is probably a question you've asked. All right. Let me start off by saying God created sex. If you didn't know that, God created sex. I know it, found, it sounds weird to talk about in church. It sounds weird to talk about here in this room, but God created sex. It wasn't people. It wasn't God created sex. He designed it and he designed it intentionally. Sex is a good thing when it's used in the context that it was designed for. Outside of its context, it's destructive. I want you to see what Jesus says in Mark chapter 10. He says this. God made them male and female. Who made them? God made them male and female from the beginning of creation. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his... Oh, not his girlfriend, not, not his fiance, no, to, to his wife. And the two are united into one since they are no longer two but one. Let no one split apart what God has joined together. See, that word joined, it's not just a physical thing. That word joined, it goes so much further. It's actually physical, it's spiritual, it's emotional, it's all of the above. It's not just a physical thing. I'm going to ask if we could pull up the next verse real quick. It says, there's more to sex than just mere skin on skin. It goes beyond the physical. Sex is as much a spiritual mystery as a physical fact. As written in scripture, the two become one. The two become one. There is a physical, spiritual, and emotional aspect that takes place. And here's the thing. Every time that we have sex, we're going ahead and we're separating something designed to be one. God designed to be together. God designed it to be not separated. Something that's together, something that's two that made one cannot be unwound. It can't be undone. See, I, anybody love coffee? Anybody could love coffee? Today I had some coffee and they gave me some, this amazing almond milk creamer. It was awesome. It tasted so good. When you go in and mix the two together though, it becomes one. Imagine if I tried to separate the creamer from the coffee. It's impossible. Why? Because when something is made two to one, it's not supposed to be separated. But yet we want to separate what God brings together. 
See, back in the day, right now, of course, we have our marriage contract that we sign when you get married, stuff like that. But back in the day, in the times of the Bible, when they would go ahead and they would sleep together, when the two would become one, that was their form of marriage. They would literally come to you. This is, this is our form of marriage. This is how we are marrying each other. But what we are doing in our society today is that we're marrying people without the covenant. We're marrying people without the blessing that God has put on them. We're marrying people without what God wants to do and what God designed. God's first command to Adam and Eve was go, be fruitful, and multiply. In other words, God's first command to Adam and Eve was go have sex. That's what he told them to do. But it was a marriage that God joined together. He made it to be pure. He made it to be intentional. It was something that was physical, spiritual, and emotional. It was all together. Every time that you have sex with someone, you are giving them a piece of yourself by the time you get married. You're not going to have much left for your spouse because you've given so much of yourself already. There's going to be a lot of pain. Thoughts because you'll just, you would have supposed to wait until marriage. All these thoughts of this other person, it's it's affected our our homes. 50% of marriages are ending now today. There's so many, abortion has, abortion rates have risen. Pornography uses at its all-time high because we always need more. We always want more. We always crave more. But yet, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians. He says, run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual morality is a sin against your own body. It's the only one that really hurts you. Trust me, if you're feeling like, hey, I have these feelings. I know what that's like. Saying, God, can, can you take away these feelings of, of me just wanting to do these things, of me wanting to have sex? Can you take away these feelings? The feelings in itself are not bad. It's just not the right time yet. It's just not the right time yet. The time will come. When the time comes after you've prepared, after God has just ordained it for you to happen, it's, it'll come. And there's just a blessing that comes behind it. And so we're, all, we're pretty much almost out of time. I'm just going to skip to my last point here. But what if you've messed up? if you messed up and you're saying, now what? Now what? I don't know what to do. I want to introduce you to a concept, not even a concept. I want to introduce you to a person. And it's this idea of grace. I'm not sure if anybody knows what this means. Grace is not a friend named Grace. It's not just this idea. Grace is a person that came from Jesus himself. If you're in this room and you're saying, hey, I've messed up in this area. I, I, I've fallen, I, I've done more things that I'm proud of and I'm ashamed in this room and I'm full of guilt. I want you to read what this word says in Mark chapter three. She says, truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins. Not just some, not, not just a few, not just the things they haven't told anybody, but all their sins and every slander they utter. If you've fallen, I want to let you know that there's, there's grace for you get right back up. You can get right back up. The Bible says that the righteous fall seven times, but they get back up. I also want to tell you that there are consequences to our mistakes. And yes, you may have given up something that is so important, so pure. And there's some things that you'll never be able to get back. But what I can tell you is that in this room, you don't have to carry shame anymore. You don't have to carry guilt anymore. You don't have to carry these feelings of I've done wrong, I've messed up, everybody hates me, I can't even I go and I'm just ashamed of what I've done. You don't have to carry this anymore. Jesus, they brought him a woman caught in adultery. She was caught and Jesus, he came and he loved on her and then he said, go and sin no more. You don't have to keep doing those things. You don't have to keep walking in the same things. You don't have to keep walking in your shame. You don't have to keep walking in your guilt, but you can come in and know that God has forgiven you. God's grace is more. The Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. Jesus, he loves you so much. He loves you so much that whether you've fallen, whether or not, he can pick you right back up. He says, I'm here with you. Let's walk on this journey together, but you don't have to keep doing the same mistakes. You don't have to keep falling for the same toxic person. You don't have to keep falling for the same mistakes over and over and over again, because the plan that he has for you is so much more. So much more. And when we honor God, a chance to say, God, I just want to turn my life around and come right back to you. I'm going to ask if everybody can stand up to their feet for a moment. With nobody looking around, 
I'm gonna ask if everybody could close their eyes and bow their heads for just a moment. If you're in this room, and again, nobody's looking around, nobody's gonna put a spotlight on you. But if you're saying, hey, I've messed up in this area, and I wanna be renewed, I wanna be refreshed. I've done things because I've tried to seek validation. I've done things because I feel like it'll make me more of a man. That doesn't make you more of a man. Following Jesus makes you more of a man because it's harder to follow Jesus right now in our society than it is to go ahead and have sex with whoever you want. It's not gonna make you more of a man. It's not gonna make you more of a woman. But if you're saying, hey, I've done this for validation. I've done this for love. I've done this for approval. And I just wanna turn my life around. But nobody else looking, I'm just gonna ask you to raise your hand. And I just wanna pray for some people in this room. But if that's you, with nobody looking around, you're saying, hey, I'm, I want to just let go of this. I, I want a fresh start in this area. I, I, I don't want to keep falling into the same sins over and over and over again. And I didn't get to go into a few of my points, but if that's you. Just raise your hand on the count of three so I know who I'm talking about. One, two, three. Come on. Hands all over. God, I pray for every single person that has fallen in this area, God. Lord, we thank you that your grace is sufficient. We thank you that your grace is enough, God. Lord, we know that we've made mistakes as we are all fallen, God, but we know that your love covers a multitude of sins, God. Your love, it covers a multitude of our wrongdoings, God. And we've all messed up. We've all done wrong, God. And sometimes we can put more sin above another, Lord. But we do see that this sin hurts us. This sin, it messes up us, God. We don't want this to take over our lives anymore, God, but we want to give our lives to you, Jesus. Lord, we want to honor you, God. We want to give you our lives, Jesus. We want you to surround everything about us, God because you are worthy of it, Lord. You're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of our honor, God. You're worthy of our sexuality, God. You're worthy of the way that we live our life. You're worthy of the way that we speak our life, God. You're worthy of it all, Jesus. We give it all to you, God. I pray for any person that's messed up in this room, Lord. I pray that you just may take away any shame that they have right now, God. They take away any guilt that they have right now, Lord, because they don't have to carry this anymore, God. There are new creations, and your word says a, a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old has gone, and the new has come, God. And we believe that. We declare that, God, they are set free, and who the, who the sun sets free is free indeed, Jesus. Lord, we give you all praise, all honor, and all glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody says amen. Amen. I do want to pray for one more group of people. Maybe you don't know who Jesus is. Maybe you've never had a relationship with Jesus. And you just heard me talk about how he gives you grace and forgiveness. And yes, he, he does. And the best gift that he could give us is that he forgave us because we all need it. But there's so much more. The Bible says that there's a price to our mistakes. There's a price to our sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And that's what we deserve. And I'm not talking about just a physical death that every single one of us is going to go through. But I'm talking about spiritual death. I'm talking about an eternal death. What we deserve is hell. That's, that's what every single one of us deserve, but Jesus says, hey, I love my people so much that I don't want them to pay that price. I, I want them to be with me in heaven, and all he wants from you is just to believe in him. So Jesus, he came, and he, he took beatings and lashings. He lived a perfect life, and yet he paid a price for something he did not do, the price that all of us deserved. He took a crown of thorns as they tried to embarrass him. They beat him, they whipped him, and all he had on his mind was you. All he had on his mind was you. He just thought, one day, this person is going to be with me in heaven. One day, this person is going to be with me in salvation. So if you're in this room and you're saying, hey, I want to know this Jesus that you're talking about. I, I want to be forgiven of my sins. I I I'm tired of walking and trying to do life on my own. I'm, trying to I'm tired of trying to do things by myself. I'm tired of running into wall after wall after wall. And I, I just want to follow Jesus. If that's you, I'm going to just count to the count of three. And I just want you to lift up your hand. Nobody is, is looking. If you could close your eyes and bow your heads for just a moment, for a moment of privacy. And if you're saying, hey, I want a new start. I, I want a fresh start. I, I want to know this God that you're talking about. If that's you, I'm just asking you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Amen. God bless you. God bless you over here. Amen. Amen. God bless you in the back. God bless you in the back. God bless you in the back. Amen. Amen. Is there anybody else? It's a little hard to see. Hey, for all the people that raised your hand and maybe you said, hey, I didn't feel comfortable raising my hand, but I want to make that decision. I want to lead you in a prayer. And it's not this prayer that saves you, but we do believe that the Bible says that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so I'm just going to lead you in this first one. From here on out, you can talk to God whenever you want. You can have a relationship with him. You can, he can speak to you. He, you can 
speak to him at any time, but I just want to make this first one easy for you. And everybody's going to join along as we say, Dear Jesus, I open my heart. I invite you inside to be my friend, to be my savior, to be my God. Jesus, I'm sorry for everything that I've done. I just want to follow you all the days of my life. Jesus, I put my hope in you. I put my trust in you. And I put my faith in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray and everybody says, come on, everybody says, come on, can we make some noise for everybody that made a decision to follow Jesus in the room? Hey, we got an incredible team in the back that wants to give you guys some Bibles. They want to give you guys a free gift. And so as we're about to sing a last song, I'm going to ask if everybody could just go ahead. Well, the ones that raise their hand, if you could go ahead and get your gift, it's going to be awesome. We want to bless you. And uh, again, I hope that bless you. I hope you can answer some of your questions. Trust me, your leaders can answer a lot more questions than you have. I have more on my notes if you guys want to come to me, ask me any questions. But I love you guys. I'm going to pray one last time.